Sorry, Nigel, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> we could turn to Revelation chapter 11, thanks. If you're anything like me, um, the details of life in this world can become quite oppressive. And um, we look around and we've got a nation that's deteriorating. Uh, on every hand, it seems that evil it has its sway. And, um, and it's frustrating, isn't it, when you just see that which is evil and wrong and sinful portrayed in a manner uh, and exalted in a manner and that which is right and good and then we come to other details the details of life there's sickness there are financial difficulties um, it's a real battle and sometimes certainly for me it's good to lift our eyes to see the big picture to look away from the details and the book of Revelation is the big picture Ultimately, it's the final picture. And the wonder, and we read that wonderful scene in heaven where God is going to set everything right. I don't know if you believe that, but sometimes it's one of the only things that keeps me going. That regardless of how things seem, regardless of how evil can reign, and let's call it evil, sin, evil, uh, regardless of how the details of our own personal lives transpire at times and the struggles we have, regardless of all those things, God is going to set everything right. And so this is a wonderful encouragement, this book, because at the, at the centre of God setting everything right is a lamb on a throne. And he's a lamb who was slain and who freely gave himself for every woe and sin and sorrow and pain in this world. And so it's a beautiful thing. I come to you as a fellow believer. We're looking at a passage that some have said is one of the most difficult in Scripture. And so I'm not going to give you all these answers. But I want you to walk through with me and... And I want us to get a sense of the greatness of God and the purpose and the power of God. I might say some things that you think, um, well, I don't quite see it that way. That's all right. I think uh, when I was looking at this, particularly the first part, I think I got about four different views of people that you would say were like-minded with us. And that's all right. So what I want to do this morning is to focus on what we can see and what we can know from this passage. And the other things, I'll leave it to you, because this is not a Bible study, to work through. So let's just have a word of prayer, shall we, and ask God, who is our God, who is our Father in heaven, to, um, to watch over us and to lead us and to speak to our hearts. Our, our Father and our God, are so conscious we are that um, all that we have, all that we are, our hope, our eternity rests in your hand. And Lord, we're thankful it rests in that hand because you demonstrated your love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and knowing, Lord, that you have given yourself, given your son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so we're a thankful people this morning and with all the, the distractions and the stresses uh, and some of the difficulties of life, we want to lift our eyes upwards and we want to see Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. Um, chapter 11 is in the period following the opening of the, not the opening, the, the, the sixth trumpet. All right, when we come to verse 14, and we're just going to look at this chapter, we read the last part of it, it said, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe comes quickly. And so there were seven seals, we, uh, we recall. 
where Christ, as the one who was worthy to open the seals, began to open these seals that, that started to unfold the purpose of God in his judgment upon this world. And when the final seal was open, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. I'm not going to stay silent for half an hour, but that would have been remarkable. No one had anything to say. And, and, and then there came a, a, a proclamation. There were seven trumpets, angels blowing seven trumpets. And each of these trumpets brought in a vision. And remember, it's a vision. It's a picture. It's a portrayal of, of, of probably a truth that is so grand, it's beyond our comprehension. So God is bringing down to us, who are but human, a, a glimpse of what is happening. It's true. It's a truth. It's a true glimpse. But let's remember, we, 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 no man can see God. John didn't see God on the throne in chapter 4 of Revelation. He, he saw him, but he just saw a glimpse of God. A glimpse of God. And we see a glimpse of those judgments unfolding. And, and so uh, when those trumpets were blown, there were uh, some horrendous judgments brought upon the earth. And in the fifth trumpet, the last three trumpets, in fact, were specifically uh, um, tagged or, or stated to be woes, woes. It's almost as if those last three trumpets, there was an intensity about God's judgment that was beyond comprehension. And in, the, um, in the, um, uh, chapter 9, the fifth, fifth trumpet, the first woe, uh, for the first time we see the abyss open. And uh, the word, the name uh, that refers to the, the creature that came from it, the leader, was Apollyon or Abaddon, destroyer. And we see uh, uh, through John's vision that the fight and the battle and all that's going on is not just on a physical plane. There is spiritual wickedness in the world. And there's a power to that wickedness that again is beyond us. And these creatures that came out of the abyss had power, it says, for five months to cause intense pain upon the people of the earth. And this was all part of that woe. And when that woe was passed, the sixth trumpet sounded and a voice was heard from the four horns of the golden altar in chapter 9 saying the sixth angel which had the trumpet loosed the four angels which abound in the great River Euphrates, and these four uh, released a whole army, hundreds of millions, and brought huge destruction. Huge destruction. And and we're still in that period, if you like, of that sixth trumpet, because in the end of chapter eleven and verse fifteen, it says the seventh angel sounded, and that brings in the seventh trumpet. The, the, the final trumpet, not the end of the judgment yet, but uh, the final trumpet. And, and then there was the interlude in chapter 10 where a mighty angel stood uh, um, and down from heaven with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. And we saw in that that, that God's power, as it was expressed in this angel, was irresistible. And we saw that his purpose was inevitable. Because uh, when the angel swore in verse 6, uh, by him that lives forever and ever and created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein, the sea, the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer, that there would be no more delay, it says. It will happen. It will come to pass. You remember in Second Peter chapter 3 that there were the scoffers and the mockers and they said, where's the promise of his coming? And I guess we can all be like that. And we can scoff today at the mention of God's judgment. But, you know, when you read this book, it's real. It's real, it's intense, and it's inevitable. And then there came, the, uh, in chapter 10, the proclamation that John was to take up 
uh, this book from the angel's hand and he was to eat it and it was going to be sweet and bitter, sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach. The truth of God is the truth of God, whether it's pleasant and nice or whether it's hard and bitter. And in Revelation, there's, there's a great deal of bitter. There's a great deal of blessing as well. But the truth is the truth we saw. And to deny the truth, well, it's stupid. <laughs> to deny the truth simply because I don't like it, you know, it, it's, it's like going to a doctor and I, I find the doctor diagnoses something that is severe. Denying that doesn't change it. It doesn't change it. So we can't deny it. We come to chapter 11 and uh, in the first few verses, let me just read this. It's, it's talking about a battle, a fight, uh, and um, let's just have a look at this. Verse 11, There was given me, this is John, a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months, which is three and a half years. And I will give power under my two witnesses, the martyrs, the witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. In the King James, again, it's, it's actually three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. You know, it's like a reminder of what happened in Egypt, isn't it? Uh, when Moses, by the, uh, God by the hand of God, brought judgment to Pharaoh. And when they shall have finished their testimony, these two witnesses, uh, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. This was Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer, the beast that came out of that pit. Uh, he uh, makes war, is the phrase. He makes war against them, and he shall overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tons and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. So here are these witnesses, right, seemingly um, immortal, seemingly they could not be defeated, they had a power over evil, uh, and yet this beast... Uh, this spiritual being was able to destroy them. And so here they're lying uh, in the streets. And they that dwell upon the earth, verse 10, look at the reaction, shall rejoice over them and make merry and make and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. I don't want to say politically incorrect things here, but let me just say we see that picture time and time again. You know when those two towers fell in the US? In some places in the world, there was rejoicing in the streets. There was rejoicing in the streets. And here we've got these two witnesses, these two people of God, and they'd been killed, done away with it seems completely defeated, and there was rejoicing in the streets at the death. And uh, they that dwell upon the earth, it says, they make merry, they send gifts to one another, there's a big party. And verse 11 says, the three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood 
upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Well, wouldn't it? (laughs) Wouldn't it? I mean, this is just... These are not things we see every day. And so I guess we're prone to think that, well, it's, it's, it's a little bit unbelievable, isn't it? Things don't happen like that. Well, you could almost say God is a bit unbelievable in that sense. Um, when God acts and moves, right, even though we don't always see it every day, things can happen. Wonderful things can happen. And awesome and devastating and dreadful things can happen. And these two witnesses stood, it says, and the fear fell upon them and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. The same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. A remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. A second woe is past and behold the third woe comes quickly. Now, just a couple of things about this passage that I want to observe first of all and then I want to draw, draw some things together because... I want, I want us to think about this whole passage and the last, last part of this it, in, three, in three ways. The first way is that God makes a distinction with regard to place. Now, when they measured this area, when he measured the temple uh, in the first uh, verse, uh, God made a distinction between certain parts of that temple. And I don't want to talk about what those different parts mean because frankly I I haven't figured it out so you'll have to get that from pastor or someone else but one thing I can see here is that God does make a distinction you know in the old temple he made a distinction between the holy of holies the holy place and the outer court God does make a distinction of place there's a distinction of place between heaven and hell God makes a distinction there are boundaries God makes a distinction with regard to participants in the story, in the his story. And when you look at the witnesses and the beast and those that are godly and those who are wicked, God makes a distinction. And the way the story unfolds, it unfolds. You could say that God is a discriminating God. We don't like the word discrimination, do we? But God will certainly discriminate. And in the final part, we will see that God will make a distinction in the prospect, not only in the place and the participants, but in the prospect of those that are part of history's story. And we see in that last uh, uh, passage there that, were, that um, Andre read for us that there will, we will be falling down and praising God. The seventh angel sounded, there were voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world had become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. And uh, the heavenly beings worship him in there. And when we go back to chapter 5, we see there's a time when every knee shall bow. Not only the hundreds of millions of heavenly beings that are described in chapter 5, but it says the things on the earth and below the earth, they're all going to worship him. And there's, so there's a distinction between an end. There is a distinction between those that become uh, God's people in the heavenly kingdom and those that are in outer darkness. There's a distinction. And by the way, these distinctions are going to lead us to the end of the message and a question. And a question. So we see that um, there's this measuring of the temple, and as I said, I'm not going to to look at that. God then uh, gives John this vision of these two witnesses, martyrs. Um, Now, this is a vision. Uh, Some people variously suggested that they are Moses and Elijah, or Enoch gets a place. Um, Some people suggest that They represent the church because it's two candlesticks, represents the two candlesticks, and the candlesticks in Revelation refer to the churches. 
Some people suggest that um, going back to Zechariah where it talks about the two olive trees and you had Joshua and Zerubbabel as two. So there's plenty of, plenty of opportunities here. <laughs> but what do we know about them? Right? We actually don't need to know who they are. We don't even need to know whether, in fact, they were two individuals or they were representative of something else. What we do know from here is that they were witnesses of God. And God has his witnesses. And they were sent to prophesy, for it says for three and a half years, and they had power. So today, at the moment where we are, there is evil is going on. Uh, and it's not always restrained. And here God, God gives these, at this instant, in this vision, uh, the, the power to stand for righteousness. And if any man seeks to hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They have power to shut heaven so that it doesn't rain in heaven sorry, in the days of their prophecy. They have power of the waters to turn them to blood, as we read, and to smite the earth. And they do, and bring the plagues as often as they will. So God has given them, them this, this power. We saw in, 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 well, in chapter 10 and earlier on, right through, you see this, this, um, this element coming out, this thread in Revelation that, even though things are happening, and even though power is being exhibited, it's always God's releasing it, you see. God's allowing it. God's allowing it. He allowed, he allowed the abyss to be opened in chapter 9 and for the destroyer to come out. I don't understand why that is, but he did. But he's got power to allow and to restrain. And that's a wonderful comfort. For a believer, in one Corinthians ten thirty, you know one of the powers we face in the Christian life is the temptation. But you know the Scripture says there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And God will not allow us to be tempted beyond that we are able. That's the restraining power of God. So every time I sin, I can't blame God. And I can't blame the devil because God will not allow me to be tempted above that I am able. And every time I sin, I sin because I choose. Now it's talking about believers there. But you see, God's power, it it enters even into the intimate part of our lives and our thoughts and what we can do and what we can't do, it's there. We need him. I need him every hour. Most gracious Lord. But his power extends to the, to the global and the cosmic as well. It was the same power when God said, let there be light. And there was light. When in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Beyond us, the power of God. In there. And so he gave these people power and it almost seemed to the, the enemies. And remember that there's, when, you, when you look at the judgments that were unfolding previous to this, that the, it seems that the intensity of wickedness was growing. Now, I don't know if, how it can get much worse than it's getting, but I guess when you read about some of the things that are happening, they're horrendous. But these enemies of the witnesses that it's talking about, these were people with hardened hearts. And we see them today. And by the way, remember that this was firstly, primarily written to the seven churches, and they were seeing it too. Because under Nero and then under Domitian, there was an increasing and horrendous persecution of the people of God. And it would have been very easy for them to think that God has lost control with this tiny little group of people and we've got this power of Rome, 
this emperor Domitian sitting there, who can do whatsoever he will? We think. And so when they start to see this, they start to see, no, no, it's not like it appears really. Because the way it appears is that the power is on the throne in Rome. But the way it is, is that God, God is exercising his power and purpose. And we see that culminate in verse 15 when it says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. See verse 17 saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. Remember the phrase also that was referred to specifically to, to the Lamb. See? God on the throne, the Lamb in the midst, and the seven spirits, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, saying, We give thanks, for thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Whether it was Apollyon, Abaddon, the beast that came out of the pit, whether it was the dragon in the next chapter who was Satan, the deceiver, the devil, whether it was the beast that came out of the sea in the presence of the dragon in the next chapters, or the beast that came from the land, these are all participants we'll read about as we move in through the book. Beings of great power, regardless you see, the time's coming when God will take whatever power he's delegated and allowed, he's going to take it back to himself. He never lost it, really. He never lost it. Isn't that a comfort? Isn't it a comfort to know that God is on the throne and all's well? And that's what it's telling us. So... So the ah oh well I've, I've certainly did, got, lost myself haven't I? So the beast so the beast of the bottomless pit comes out. These two witnesses they had this power given by God and there's this battle. There's a war. It's described as a war, and the two witnesses are destroyed. And uh, then um, you know there's great rejoicing. And as we read it in the in the uh, portrayal of that vision, uh, the uh, they're raised from the dead picture of God's power and judgment and they're taken up to heaven and there was this great earthquake the second while was passed the third woe starts with the seventh trumpet and it seems a strange place to start uh, a woe where it's describing Christ in the heavens um, but let me just let me just describe the end of it, which I think is the end of it, the end of the woe, because each of those um, each of those series of seals and trumpet, trumpets, and then finally the bowls or the vials, represent an increasing intensity of judgment. And I think I said this before. Uh, it it it's not clear that they are consecutive. In fact, it seems like they are descriptions. Of, of that whole tribulation period in increasing intensity. And the reason I say that is that the end of the judgments that come in the opening of the seal, there's this almost final cataclysmic event uh, that you see in the end of chapter 6, where it says the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, etc., uh, they cry out to the rocks to fall upon them, and to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. So it almost seems like it's, it's picturing to God, uh, uh, to John, this whole picture of, of increasing judgment until the end. And then you get that repeated in, in, the, in, in the trumpets, because when the seventh su- trumpet sounds, it's all wrapped up. The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And here they're saying, we thank you, God, because you've taken your power. And in verse 18, the nations were angry and their wrath is come. Thy wrath is come. Thy wrath is come. And you see 
the culmination and intensity of that wrath in chapter 14, because there are a number of things that happened before, but if you look at the end of chapter 14, if I just try and bring it together, um, it talks about that harvest. You know, you, you've heard the song, Thine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, and, and they talk about the greats of wrath, <laughs> the tread. I think it's something like that. Maybe Mrs Honey can sing it to us or something. So, but you, you have a look at it. You have a look at those last verses from verse 18. Another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle anything, saying, sorry, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle unto the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So this scene in heaven, in chapter 11, if you like, where it's saying God has taken to himself finally all the power, and where it's describing verse 18, the nations were angry, thy wrath is come, the time of the dead that they should be judged, it's come, it's come, the wrath has come, and you see at it, it elaborated, if you like. So by the time you see in verse 14, you get this horrendous scene. Now the scene was pretty bad at the end of the seals where they cried for the rocks to, to fall upon them. That was, that was intense, that was bad. But remember God's giving um, John these pictures, these visions. And I don't know whether he gave him, uh, he left the strongest visions to the end because they were the hardest to bear or whether there's a time element to them, I don't know. But, but the, the, the truth that is here is that that, that judgment is, is a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the cataclysmic events that were described in the end of 6, I guess, mirror the cataclysmic intensity of the judgment here, where he describes it like a, a wine press. And, and, and with the way that grapes are trod down in a wine press and, and, and the life is squeezed out of them, and he's describing the judgment of God like that, as if all the wicked are placed in this wine press of the wrath of God that is pressing and crushing and is irresistible and inevitable. Dear friends, it, it will happen. It will happen. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very unpleasant thing to think about. I remember reading a book about uh, um, pain and suffering in the Christian life. And the author makes an observation. He said that the doctrine of hell, he didn't like that doctrine. It was the most unpalatable doctrine in the scriptures. If he had written this book, he wouldn't have put it in there. He said, but I can't help but believe it. Jesus taught it. And you could say that about this judgment that's coming. It's very unpalatable. And, and when we talk about this, some people tritely say, well, you're just trying to scare people into the kingdom of God. It's not about scaring people into the kingdom of God. Remember, the truth has got sweetness and it's got bitterness. It's about proclaiming the truth. And the truth is that the day is coming when the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of our God. We sing, sing that. <laughs> I wish I could sing it the way Handel wrote it, but I can't. Um, and, and even though the nations were angry, this judgment's going to come. So wh where does it bring us? Where does it bring us? We, we're going to go on 
in the next chapters it talks about, it's almost like it, it, uh, it takes a step back and says, uh, it starts to describe a bit of historical context around the dragon who's the devil and the woman uh, and the birth of the son, the Christ, coming into the world. So he's, he's, he paints this historical picture and this battle that goes on in heaven. But, but the flow here, if you like, through the judgment through the judgment is that inevitably it's leading to a time when just as God made a distinction in this beginning in terms of the temple, uh, there are different areas that he distinguished uh, and he dealt with in a different way and he made a distinction in terms of the way the participants played out this story here and he makes a distinction in the end. His final distinction is the new heaven and the new earth and the hell. We live in a day of grey, don't we? Uh, there was that horrendous movie that they, the series they brought out, wicked stuff, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. You know, it's it's portraying, uh, portraying this idea that it's there's no right or wrong, and somehow you can you know you can just move along. One of the things that Revelation shows us is that whatever colours we want to use. <laughs> In the final analysis, there's a divide. There's a divide. In this chapter, there was a divide between the two witnesses and the beast. There was a divide. In the previous chapters, there was a divide between the saints after the fifth seal was broken, who under the altar, the martyrs, cried out, Oh, how long, O Lord. There was a divide between the righteous the saved and the wicked and the evil. Somebody observed, and it's happening today, and this was written back in the 20th century, Chesterton, in early 20th century, said it, it seems strange to him that in all the papers that were reporting events, they never would say something was right or wrong, good or bad. You know, someone was killed and it was a horrendous crime or it was ghastly, or they might even say it was inhuman. But nobody wanted to write it, say it was right or wrong. You know, it wasn't that the crime's horrendous. It's wrong. It's evil. It's sinful. And that divide is going to divide evil from righteousness. And there's no fence. So the big question where I finish The big question, perhaps the only question for us, because we can't influence this, you see. This is going to happen. We can't influence, (laughs) we can't resist the power of God and what's happening in this. The only question is which side do you want to be on? Which side? Do you want to be on the witness's side? Do you want to be on the martyr's side? That's what the word means, actually. Witnesses, martyrs. That's where we get the word. Martyr. So it seems the idea of being a witness back then was generally often a witness unto death. Maybe it'll come like that for us. You want to be on their side? Or do you want to be a side of the dragon? The beast? Abaddon? Do you want to be on the good side or do you want to be on the evil side? That's the only question. Back in Joshua's day, it's not a new question, by the way. Back in Joshua's day, when they had entered the land, they'd conquered many of the, the, um, uh, uh, the enemy. They hadn't, unfortunately, got rid of them all the way that they were meant to. And you probably know where I'm going here. And, and Joshua stood before the people and he pressed this question upon them as well. He didn't know about the witnesses and the beast. He didn't know about that scene. He didn't know about the abyss and the heaven battle, if you like, in the way that we can see it here. He didn't know that. But he did know about the evil side and the righteous side. He did know that. And he said to these people, if it seems evil to you, 
to serve the Lord, you choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers on the other side of the flood and whence they came, or whether you serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. You choose. Do you want to serve the gods of tradition from where you came, the things that shape this world in a human perspective? Do you want to serve the gods in the world you live today, where we are? You, you choose. You choose your side. As for me and my house, what did he say? We will serve the Lord. I said it before, I'll probably keep on saying it. We can choose the side. I can't understand that God would do that. Just like when he knocked on the door of the church at Laodicea, he didn't open the door. He said, you choose, you open it. What a condescending love that he would allow us to keep God shut out. We could choose. Joshua said, you choose, you people. Choose, choose, choose. But you can't choose the consequence. You can choose the side, but you can't choose the consequence. And when Christ takes the power to himself the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And when he comes in the picture of the horse we see in Revelation 19, that vision of the conquering king, when he comes, you can't can't influence that. You can't influence that, that consequence. And when people stand before the great white throne and the books are open and another book is open, the book of life, And every name that was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You will have no choice. Impotent. 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 But today you could choose. Where do you stand with Christ? It's not about choosing him in the sense that I, I say, oh, well, look, I've got power over God to choose. It's about humbling myself before Almighty God and saying, the way I'm living, the things I'm doing, the choices I'm making are abhorrent to God. They're evil. They're wrong. I'm heading in a direction that is contrary to God, and I want to turn around. My brother there would call that repentance. That's what it is. It's turning around. It's choosing the side choosing the side. Have you chosen? I know a lot of you dear people and I don't know your hearts though but have you chosen? Please choose. Because it doesn't matter you're sitting at church today. It doesn't matter how you dress. I know I've got a tie in that and some of you don't. Big deal. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even how people think of you and perceive you or what your plans are in life, the only thing that will matter is which side you've chosen. Which side you've chosen. I've said enough. Nigel's going to lead us through on the last hymn. Please think about those words, but it begins about choosing sides. So let's sing it.